I suppose the idea is in that previous subject when you were looking at ways of knowing and you went to the gallery and you looked at pictures, um, when we look at uh, a picture, we're not just looking at a picture as an individual, we're looking at a picture as a consequence of the life that we've lived and the culture in which we're embedded. And, and what influences what we see and what influences us when we look around at nature is this, these whole sets of, of values that underpin our society. And there's a group of thinkers um, who, and they call themselves feminists, um, and they're both men and women, um, who bring our attention to the assumptions that we've made about how we are in the world. And particularly they try to highlight relationships of gender and issues around gender, which is why it's called feminism. Um, and then uh, connect those to our relationships with nature, um, which is a pretty interesting thing to look at. So um, if we think about how we talk about nature, you know, we gender nature, like nature is gender. We talk about um, the, the earth being she. We talk about, um, you know, the weather and we put a gender on that. Interestingly, we talk about God as being male. So we've got this kind of uh, male God, but we have a female earth. And, and you know, feminists would say, well, there's a value embedded in that. So if we think about how we are in nature, um, if we're talking about female earth, then women are caring. Um, the, the deities associated with the earth tend to be female. And so we have this kind of uh, women in harmony with nature and men in as conquerors of nature. And if you think about the outdoor areas, you know, we think about people being out of their comfort zones, about challenge and about sort of conquering. And so there's this whole um, set of metaphors that go with people being outdoors that tend to be more masculine. And so if people can think about, well, how am I when, I, when I'm outdoors? Am I conquering or am I, am I connecting and caring? And think about, you know, particularly outdoor ed that's based in outdoor pursuits, it tends to be a conqueror, oppressive type relationship. And so it's really interesting even to look at language and think about the language that students use. You know, like, um, I'm going to shoot the rapid. You know, I'm going to beat this hill. I'm going to conquer this hill. Oh, you know, I've even had students write, um, oh, I thought the climb was going to beat me, but I beat it in the end after a great battle. You know, so using kind of military battle metaphors to describe their relationship with the natural world, as opposed to a metaphor that's more based in sort of caring. So eco-feminists would say, look, the subjugation of women, so the oppression of women by men throughout history, and we can't argue with that, that exists, it still exists today, but that oppression of women by men as a consequence of the men making the rules, that that has a parallel to the oppression and the dominance and the subjugation of nature by humanity. And so hence the word eco-feminism that connects the subjugation of women with the subjugation of the natural world. And, and it happens all the time. And, and to digress for a second into Genesis, you know, like this whole concept of having dominion over the earth, that humans are superior to nature. And that, of course, humans are personified by men um, having dominance over nature. And so eco-feminism brings to the fore and says, hang on, I'm going to challenge those assumptions and I'm going to say, um, is that the relationship that you really want to have with the natural world? or you want to have something that is more based around caring, that is more based around connection and interaction in a loving relationship as opposed to a conquered dominant relationship. And, and you see it in, in examples all the time. There's, if I can pull out a couple of photographs, if you have a look at the way in which women are photographed outdoors, they tend to be uh, in positions of solitude or in communion with nature. They might be reading, sitting under a tree, they might be, um, you know, floating in a boat or, or they might be just posing against a rock in some way. So women are in harmony with nature. Whereas often when you see men represented in either photographs or in art, they're dominant. They're cutting down a tree, they're herding the sheep, they're riding the horse, um, they've got muscles showing on the back, their back as they climb a rock face. So the representation of men in nature is dominant, um, aggressive conqueror, and the representation of women is quiet, in harmony, uh, and, and the women 
add to the scenery. You know, they're really just adding to the scenery of nature. So might, it's interesting, I think, I'll just, I'll just read this from, uh, this comes out of a climbing magazine. It's by a person called Mia Axon, and, and Mia's probably one of the top female climbers in the US, or, or was, a number of years ago. And, and I suppose this, for me, is a really nice piece of writing, firstly, but it's also a, a lovely way of um, demonstrating the change relationship with nature in a really traditionally masculine, conqueror type activity of climbing and she talks about uh, about climbing and she in this particular way and I'll read it last year in early spring I had a love affair with a climb located in the wild western desert a piece of limestone captured my heart with all the nuances of a fickle lover giving holding back proud moody demanding requiring patience and perseverance I came close to work walking away more than once but I was in love I couldn't leave I was addicted to the feeling of fluid strength I found during those rare but wonderful moments when the climb and I were doing well. I was a prof professional musician for more than a decade, but I expressed myself far more through climbing than I ever did with music. When I dance up the rock effortless, effortlessly, naturally, that's when I'm a true artist. Um, fantastic bit of writing. Like, I, I, I emotionally connect with that piece of writing, like I feel almost now a bit choked because it, it's an expression of people in harmony with nature doing something that is physically very demanding and stressful, but it's not about a battle, it's about love. Um, and I think that's the sort of connection that ecofeminism says, hang on, we can be like this, it doesn't have to be an oppressive conceptual framework, it doesn't have to be an oppressive conceptual uh, metaphor around which our relationship with nature are built. I love that. Um, so I've talked a little bit about the implications for practice in how we might try to be, you know, like trying to be more connected and responsive to a place rather than sort of conquering and dominant. And, and that can be reflected in language. But there's some, also, there's some other really interesting implications from ecofeminism about our relationship with nature that I'd like to explore. And, and the first one is that whole metaphor that you would have explored in ways of knowing in that it's a personal relationship. So when I relate to you and we re relate together as friends, then that's a personal relationship. When I relate to the outdoors through an ecofeminism lens, it's the same relationship. It's a relationship between me as an individual and nature as an individual come entity. And that's a real dilemma for ecofeminism. And, and, and there's been a lot of philosophical debate about that because what is a nature entity? Is it Mount Arapiles or is it an owl or is it um, this particular climb? And so, you know, nature can be, can be holistic or it can be individual, but to have a relationship, I have to identify the individual within that to have that sort of connection. Um, because, and, and this is what, comes from ecofeminism is that when I have a relationship with somewhere like Arapiles then I develop a sense of care and responsibility and so ecofeminism as a form of environmentalism is based in a relational sense of care so I understand and relate to Mount Arapiles I therefore get upset if it gets damaged if I, I, I get upset if I can see that Arapiles is, is suffering from some um, threat, you know, be that overuse, be it bushfire, be it pest invasion or whatever. So um, that relational sense, that, that relation is really important because that provides the motivation to act. So it shifts us from me saying someone ought to do something about this to thinking I've got to do something about this because I'm, rela you know, I'm related to that thing. So it's a relational sense of care. Um, in order to do that, I have to value intuitively the relationship and the relationship has to build and grow. So how do relationships grow? We have to be physically connected. We have to have this direct personal connection between myself and Arapiles. And so I, I know now, if I know what it smells like, I know what it feels like, I know what the experience is over time. It's direct and it's personal. And, and for me, that's the one most powerful thing that outdoor education produces in schooling. It gets young people to directly connect to the natural world in a visceral, heartfelt, 
emotional kind of way, in direct personal connection. Sure, you go and then find out about what sort of rock type it might be and what else lives there, and you find out about the neighbours in there. But it's that direct personal connection to place that is the core of the belief about ecofeminism's relationship with the natural world. Um, and that's the basis of caring. So ecofeminists would call that a relational self. So there's a relational self here. I am in relation to something else. Um, and that would contrast with other ways of knowing like deep ecology, which calls for a sense of sort of cosmology around unity of humans and nature, which is pretty hard to get your head around. Whereas ecofeminism is our caring is based on relationships. And the strength of that relationship gives to me the strength or the motivation to act to care. If I'm not strongly related, then I care about, but I don't care to act. I care about uh, deforestation in the Amazon. Never done anything about it. I just care about it. I have not a motivation to act because I have no direct contact and direct relationship with the Amazon. I just kind of know a bit about it. I care about it, but I'm not going to act. Whereas I care strongly about, say, the Grampians because that's sort of where I live, and so therefore I'm motivated to, to act because the caring is stronger, I'm closer to it, there's more proximity, there's more personal direct connection, so the motivation is higher. And that's just common sense. There's a dilemma uh, that comes from this for eco-feminists and uh, there's not a good response. And that is that out of care comes possession. The stronger I'm connected to something and the more I care for it, the more I develop a sense of possession. And how have people over millennia defended possession? With violence. And that's the big dilemma for ecofeminism, that if I'm so connected to something that I feel it's so fundamentally part of me, I will defend the, um, the trauma that might be threat or the threats that are coming to that place ultimately with aggression. And uh, that becomes a, a, a very complex uh, problem for ecofeminism. Um, and that's where the whole tenor of the Greeny movement and the the um, argument against um, extreme left environmentalism comes from, that, that ultimately environment, uh, environmentalists can be seen to be caring so much about a tree that they're ignoring other relationships such as relationships with other humanity or with the lives of the timber worker or the lives of the miners and their families and their kids and all of that. And that's, that's the perennial dilemma for uh, eco-feminist driven environmentalists.